And then each of these up here on the stage is going to have the opportunity to have 10 minutes if they choose to. I, we're not going to force them to do that, but if they choose to, they can take that time to present more information about this situation. After that, we're going to have an open question and answer session. And we've been passing out some index cards and some pens. If anybody has a question that would like to have asked tonight, please write that down and get that up to us here um, <clears throat> so we can have those at the end of this time to go over some of those things. If there is an opportunity after that, we might be able to have some more questions depending on the time, <clears throat> but we have till 8.30 and we will end on time. So that's enough for me, Ann. Well, as Daryl told you, we're working together. And it's kind of, some of the people are kind of scratching their heads wanting to know, you know. So he and I got together and we decided it could start here in Montgomery County. Both parties working together. We wanted to be, if there's anything in Frankfurt or the, uh, Washington that's coming to, the, that can be given out to a county, Daryl and I are going together and get it for our community. We're working for the community, not as a, an, a party. And uh, like I say, I've loved Daryl a lot longer than he's been a chairman and we've been friends for years, so it wasn't hard to, to work with him. So you all be sure and ask questions and make sure that you get the answer you want when you, when you leave here. And I'm disappointed that so many people that threw a fit about this, that didn't, won't come down and see what the real answer is. So I'll turn it over to Daryl again. Thank you, Ann. And now I'm just going to turn the microphone and I think that one works okay right there in front of you, Al. Yes, sir. If you want to, whichever you want to do. And uh, just take okay. some time and you may have to turn it on. It's right there by the bottom of the hill. Is it on? Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Daryl and Ann, uh, Republican Party, Democratic Party, for hosting this event tonight and giving us the opportunity to come and speak to you, uh, Mayor Al Botts, City of Mount Sterling. Uh, I don't have any prepared notes. I'm just going to start talking, okay? Uh, and, and before we begin, let me say there are three council members here. Um, do not take that there are three council members that are not here. Um, they couldn't be here tonight because if they were here, then we would that'd be an open meeting, uh, and we would have had to have advertised that. Um, so the fact that they're not here doesn't mean that they're they're sharking any sort of responsibility to the public. Uh, it's just these three council members were the ones that uh, chose to come tonight. Um, the other three have made it clear that they're available uh, anytime. You can go on the city website and get their contact information, and they're happy to have a conversation with you about their opinion or their view on this occupational tax increase uh, that we are voting on next week. As mayor, I'm a non-voting member, um, so the council will decide uh, if the city uh, chooses to go along with the tax increase, but I will say that I fully support it. I support it because I think it's in the best interest of the city of Mount Sterling. Every decision I've ever made, I've only been mayor for four months now, uh, but every decision I've ever made as mayor, every decision I've ever made as a council member, is what's in the best interest of the city of Mount Sterling. And I'll explain those reasons why. Council, for years and years, city council has always had that uh, opinion. We make decisions based on what we feel is in the best interest of this community. We're just here holding spots for a time period. City of Mount Sterling, we've got to look not just to the now, but to the future. Okay, what our kids and grandkids are gonna inherit. I support this because I believe we've come to a time, and the county will speak to it, the county says that they have real needs that need to be addressed. Okay, not wants, but needs. The city and the county had an opportunity a few years back to sit down, and hindsight's always 2020. We wish that they could have sat down and come out to an agreement that 
the occupational tax could have been addressed and maybe it could have been raised incrementally instead of having the jump from one to two percent. I realize that's a huge jump. It's a huge jump. My employees are getting it. I get it. Okay, I'm putting it on good friends of mine in this community. It's been a trying time. Um, but when I sit and look at it and know that the county says this is a need, then I have to look at this as Mayor of Mount Sterling and say, if the county needs this, then I have to support it. What's in the best interest of this community? I don't have, it's not my job to question how they're spending their money, what, what the jail is, uh, what it's costing to run the jail, what they're spending on their road department. They make those decisions, not me. So I look at it from our perspective as a city. I want a strong county government. I want a, and the, the county government wants a strong city government. I want a strong Camargo. I want a strong Jeffersonville. I want these communities. We, we should be looking at things jointly. We should be looking at things with a shared vision. And I think we're doing so. The, there are many communities where the judge executive and the mayor do not get along. <clears throat> They don't get along because they're competing for a tax base. They're competing for occupational tax, property taxes. We've not had that here because we've had a great document, an interlocal agreement since the mid 80s, which says that the occupational tax, which is collected at 1%, is split between the city and the county. The county taking 60%, the city drawing 40%. If you wonder where those numbers came from, it's real simple. At the time they drew up the document, that is about what the county was bringing in, 600,000, and the city was collecting about 400,000. So that's where those numbers come from. So the document was drawn then to share that occupational tax that comes in. Now that's been good for the city of Mount Sterling. That's been good for this community because that means we have a city that doesn't have to go out and look to annex properties in order to increase a tax base. So that's why the city of Mount Sterling, you, you, you don't really see the city growing that much. We grow when we put in a new subdivision or maybe a new commercial center goes in. If, if, and the thought process usually is, are you getting city water or not? That's generally how we decide whether we're gonna annex that property or not. But that's happening on the front end. In a lot of communities around the state, your cities are trying to gobble up real estate, and it's because they're competing with the county, okay? We have not had that happening here. We've had a good agreement between the two of us. So now fast forward to where we're at now. The county has said they have some needs that need to be addressed, and they're going to have to address the occupational tax. But as I said before, as mayor, then I have to say, having an interlocal agreement, then we need to go along with you. I told you, I'm not voting on this, but I support it. But, but we need to go along with the county because I want a strong county, number one. Number two, the city doesn't want to go it alone. I can tell you, if we were to say, as a council, that we're voting no, we're against this, we're not doing it. Well, now that agreement is broke, county's are you all still going to vote 2%? That's the plan. You're still going to get 2%, but now the city is going to have to impose its, a, its separate tax within city limits. So without an agreement from the county, which is going to allow us to get credit for business owners within the city, now you're paying a city and a county. And guess what? It just went up. So I understand people are upset, but when you get upset and say, I want you all to vote no, you're voting for more taxes in the city. I know that's not what you're wanting. And that's part of what we're here tonight to try to answer some of those questions. I have sat down with individuals in this room and had great conversations. We may have got up afterwards and not seen eye to eye, but at least we could shake each other's hand and say, I understand where you're coming from. So tonight, I just ask, did you understand where I'm coming from as mayor and why I'm supporting this? because I believe it's in the best interest of the city that we do not break that interlocal agreement with the county. I think it's in the best interest of the city that we're not trying to go it alone and have a decrease in revenue for occupational tax, because if we go it alone and we get that 1%, guess what? I'm taking a decrease in revenue 
and we're laying off police officers. I don't think that's what anyone wants in this community. It's not what I want. So it's a tough decision, certainly, that the city's in. But from my perspective, I think it's the right decision that we make as a city government that we go along with the county and support them fully when we look at this occupational tax. Because the alternative would be much higher taxes in the city, and now you've got a city government which has performed very well, I think. I'm very proud of our city government that would find some financial difficulties in the future and be forced to raise occupational taxes or property taxes or something else even more. So that's where I'm coming from. And I know we'll have more questions tonight, but I hope that at the end of the night, and I will stay until the door closes. So Ron, I know you're back there and you got the key. Whenever you decide that the door's closing tonight, I'm here. City Hall is always open. Like I said, I've had good conversations with people in this room, and I just hope that you see where I'm coming from as mayor, that I think we're not getting anywhere as a community. We're not getting anywhere as a city if we separate. And I don't think we're getting anywhere as a community if we start taking things away from ourselves, our kids, and our grandkids. Thank you. I'll try not to be as long as Al was. <laughs> well, I'll ec echo a lot of the same words that he mentioned in regards to the need. This is not a want for any of us. And if anyone on the city council or anyone on the fiscal court, this is not a want. This is a need. This is something that has to be done. Uh, we have, and the reason being, we have employees retirement match that has gone up since 2011 from 16 percent to 21 percent health insurance is mandatory and that retirement benefit match is also mandatory the liability insurance on all the properties that we have workers comp insurance auto insurance fuel all this stuff we have to have we have gone into our reserve, and if we don't do something to raise some revenue, within two years, the county's going to be bankrupt. Simple. We have approximately 200 miles of uh, county roads that we maintain, and that's not just driving over them every day. That's, we mow them uh, four times a year. We run that about four times a year. We clean the ditches. We are cleaning culverts, replacing culverts, we're replacing bridges to repave one mile of county road is approximately $90,000 a mile. So our roads, right now, our roads are on a 25 year plan, rotation plan. Uh, that's, that's not good. Uh, we're out every day uh, patching potholes, repaving uh, roads, Moving debris off the roads, trees. We have uh, the jail. We have a jail which houses uh, roughly 200 inmates. The medical care for the jail has increased dramatically, and we must, we have to have medical care at the jail. The food service at the jail they prepare 700 meals a day. They're 200 inmates 220 inmates we feed them three times a day that's roughly 700 meals a day at the jail they have to maintain do the laundry for 220 inmates or 210 inmates they have to do those things every day uh, we have i have cut the road department from 18 employees when i came in 2011 i have 12 now that include the road supervisor we, we have, and we've lost a lot of revenue. Uh, we've had four industries to leave in the last two years. That's been Regal Beloit, Fletching the Metal, uh, Pentair, Black Mountain Door. We provided animal removals for the farmers. 
we like to say we have we lost uh, revenue in a road road fund, Kentucky rule uh, roads. Uh, we've lost funds in that. We have emergency management director. We have to have these guys solid waste coordinator. We support the sheriff's department, pay his deputies roughly five hundred. Four fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year, and do the retirement match. <clears throat> we have a corner that we support, pay his salary. Uh, building inspector. Then we have loans. We have two roughly two million dollar loans. One at the health department, and one at the jail. The health department we're losing roughly seventy thousand dollars a year from them because they're downsizing. They cannot cannot afford to pay our rent. <coughs> or the rent they have uh, right now. They're losing some em employees, they're laying off, or they're transferring to other jobs. We've lost uh, real secondary road money, I like to say the coal severance tax. So it's, it's now, it's a need that we have to raise this occupational tax. Uh, none of us want it, but it's a need, something we have to have. Thank you. Daryl, we just. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rachel Adams, and I am one of the county commission, one of the three county commissioners here in Montgomery County. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. I hate that it's under these circumstances. Uh, I promise you, each elected official up here right now uh, does not want to be here. We hate to even oppose this tax. But I, I can tell you that it's imperative that we do this, or the county is going to be in a tough shape here in a couple of years. Uh, as Wally stated, it's not a it's it's not a want, but it's a need, and it's definitely something. In order to keep the doors open and keep our different offices, the jail and whatnot, open, we have to pass this. Uh, what's amazing about this tax and. and Am I correct? It was, it was passed in the 70s, 1970s. That's 40 years. <clears throat> Guys, I, people say I've changed in 40 years. I don't think so, but that's what people are saying. So, uh, But, uh, you know, it's somebody down 40 years ago came up with this idea. And I'm going to tell you, it was a great idea. Mount Storm Montgomery County wouldn't be where they're at now if we didn't have this tax. And it's like anything else, it runs its course. And, and we're at that at that point, that if we don't act now, down the road, we're gonna be wishing that we had. And a lot of other people don't realize, when we started looking at this tax, uh, we realized that, uh, well, when they done the history on it, that uh, during that, the uh, if, if we, the Montgomery County citizens, go, population goes over 30,000, we can't go back, we, we're stuck at 1%. So it would have been nice 2008 that they might have raised it a half percent. We wouldn't be here today probably. But if we don't take this 4% now and we go over 30,000 people in the next year or so, there's no coming back. And there's no other place to really draw money from uh, other than property tax. And I know, I don't think anybody wants to go down that road. So uh, that, that is where we're at, where we're at and uh, I don't know if a lot of people understands now or knows that even Bath County is changing July 1st to their one to two percent. Uh, as Wally stated, um, we saw this coming down the road a few years ago. Um, the loss of the four factories was huge. A quarter of a million dollar tax revenue, payroll tax. Uh, the rise in the pension goes up every year. Uh, we're at the mercy of the state on a lot of this stuff the health benefits, materials, every day. I just watched the, the, the TV the while ago before I came. Walmart's raising their prices today because of the tariffs. Uh, but if we continue to go as we're going right now, nothing changes, we'll be good for two, two or three more years. And if we pass this tax, we will be good for probably another 20 to 22 years. But the thing about city government, county government, it's the unknowns. It changes day to day. We don't know what kind of catastrophic incident we're gonna have. We repaired two roads this year. Uh, 
uh, spent a lot of money. So there is a lot of unknowns in the county government and the city government. So uh, you just can't come down to come down to a direct figure and, and stay with that because things change on a daily basis. Our jail, I can't commend Eric enough. Uh, it's a daily battle. Uh, we're always putting fires out. There's something going on on a daily basis. Uh, and the cost is rising, guys. It, it's coming down to, we do, do we want to jail or do we want to ship them out? And uh, Eric's done a great job of trying to use state inmates to compensate for the loss that we, we've had. And uh, it, it's the Montgomery County inmates that we don't receive anything on. We pay their medical. They have cancer treatment, we pay for it. They have open heart, we pay for it. They're on Suboxone, we pay for it. Guys, it, it's, this drug ep epidemic has really got us in a pickle. And, uh, and it's a daily fight. So I hope that that gives you a better understanding why we do need this 1%. Because if we don't do it this extra percent, if we don't do it, then I, I don't know where we're going to end up at. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Eric Jones. I'm your uh, Montgomery County Jailer. And then I'm pretty much uh, you know the spotlight on the tax uh, you know there's no hiding that um, and, and in a fiscal court meeting the workshop we've talked about this for eight years since i've been there uh, this ain't something that just came up I've, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, elected three times here in montgomery county and when i come in office in 2011 it was talked about then uh, and i will tell you i've seen it firsthand that our judge executive and our, our county commissioners work diligently to, to cut the fat, to cut everything we possibly can. Uh, you know, we've had, there's no secret, we've had battles. You know, I feel like I'm right every time they feel like they are. <laughs> but at the end of the day, everybody in that room is wanting to do one thing. It, it's all about getting what's best for every individual in this county. Uh, it's not about our, our city residents or our county, it's about entire Montgomery County. You know, every entity works hard as elected officials that we didn't have to do this. But at the end of the day, we all knew it was coming. Um, did, did we want to be the ones to do it on this court? Absolutely not. But when you elect me every time, I promise you during my campaign that I'm going to represent everyone here and do what's, what I feel like is best. And that's not only with your tax dollars, that's the operations of my facility. Every decision I make is based on what's best for this community. Uh, many nights uh, when everybody's home asleep, me and my staff uh, and my chief deputy is here in the back. And he's salary, and, and you know I get paid the same. So there's many nights that me and him are sitting in hospitals uh, here in Lexington, um, so we don't have to pay as much overtime. Uh, you know, there's times we'll have five and six uh, inmates that have to go to the hospital in, in one night. Uh, so what that does is it pulls myself. Uh, uh, away from my family, it pulls my chief deputy away from his family. Uh, we still have to operate the jail on jail standards and have it staffed to uh, meet the specifications uh, for safety. So what we do is we have to call in employees uh, and go sit at the hospitals. Uh, we work hard uh, with the, the judges and stuff. If it's something we can get them out, we try to get them released, so they're, they're the ones having to pay the bills. But at the end of the day, in the last two years, uh, our medical costs have, are, are astronomical. Uh, and this is something that is required. Uh, in the last two years, we had a, uh, we had an inmate that had to have daily dialysis. And if any of y'all know, that those costs are just unreal. Uh, we've had three inmates that had weekly chemo treatments. Uh, we've had two inmates that had heart surgeries. Uh, the, uh, like uh, Rachel was saying, the drug epidemic. Uh, I'm shocked 
and I've been there nine years, but the amount of female inmates, when I worked there as a deputy back in 95, we didn't have more than 10 female inmates. Today, I've got over 50, and I've had up to 90. And the medical cost on detoxing the fetus of a pregnant female that is detoxing off drugs, um, we're not equipped to do that. Uh, I've got you know great medical staff, but we're not equipped to detox fetuses at a county jail. Uh, we had to send those to, uh, straight to the UK, which we sat on. Uh, those are inmates you, you can't release. You can't release a, a female so she can go out and harm uh, her child uh, just because we're gonna have to pay the cost. If they're arrested and they're breaking the law in our community, it's our job to house them. Uh, so we're gonna pay those costs. Um, when we start talking about budgets and line items, the cost of running our facility has went up. Uh, from 2010, uh, we were at $1.2 million the year before I come into office. Myself, uh, Judge Wally and Johnson and, and Billy Ray uh, worked hard. That was before Rackle and Melody come along, but we worked hard. I mean, many hours uh, of getting that reduced. Every year we, we saw a reduction in the, in the facility where we got down to around 700000 That sounds astronomical when you're when you're th throwing numbers out there but at the end of the day you're looking at roughly over a half a million dollars that we were cutting per year from when we took office and that's something i'm very proud of but at the end of the day the drug epidemic come along and if since 2016 our medical cost of uh, nearly tripled to where we're looking at from a quarter of a million dollars now we're looking over half a million that we're spending on inmate health care. That's required. Uh, half a million dollars to me is crazy when we're sitting here thinking we're talking about child molesters, rapists, murders, uh, people outbreaking the community. But at the end of the day, there's laws that we're responsible to make sure they are treated with medical attention. If we if we fail to meet those requirements, we're gonna we're gonna be in a lawsuit. Uh, nine years, you know, that's, that's a liability is my biggest fear, uh, uh, and it's part of it. And at the end of the day, if you don't treat them medically, we're going to be sued, and it's going to be a lot more cost than five hundred thousand dollars to the community. Um, but you know, this is the things that were required. I'm very proud of the fact that that when I took office, that our average food cost per inmate per meal was over four dollars, and now we. We got that cost down to like a dollar nineteen per inmate per meal, uh, but at the end of the day, that's just something that's required. Uh, so, if you look at the uh, the medical cost, the building maintenance, we're looking at a building that was built in 1985. Uh, that building was built with a lot of obsolete parts. Uh, when we go to replace what we would consider a two hundred dollar part, you have to replace the two thousand dollar whole system because they don't make that $2 part anymore. Uh, building maintenance has went, went up. Uh, all the lines are cast. Uh, so when they collapse, you're digging concrete. Uh, we use MA labor uh, and save thousands upon thousands every year by using inmates to do the labor on, on the digging of the floors. And, and the city's been very really gracious, the county barn, of letting us borrow the equipment to do that work. Um, and if people want to question the line item, uh, I've seen line items about our salaries are so high. We are the least paid jail in this area. My staff uh, on average makes $2 less an hour in Clark County, Round County. Uh, our, our, our salaries since 2010 has went up 320000 a year. Uh, again, those numbers sound a lot to, to us normal people, but if you break it down to 47 employees, uh, that's an average of 40000 a year, which breaks down to $851 per employee a year raises. That's a year. Uh, that's $16 a week uh, to pay the employees that are dealing with the inmates I told you about, rapists, murderers, child molesters, on a daily basis. 90% of our inmates uh, have communicable diseases that my staff deal with on a daily basis without getting hazardous duty pay. Um, 
you know, I commend my staff. I feel like they're the best in the state. It's been known statewide that we run a great gym, uh, and it's due to my staff. Uh, so when you look at individual line items, um, the medical, the salaries, uh, building maintenance, it's, it's been on the rise. Uh, we started in 2010, we had 42 employees, we have 47 now. So, and our average daily population was 178 when I come into office and it's 248 today. Uh, so, you know, we added uh, roughly five to six staff members. Two of those are out in the community picking up garbage every day that is paid out of commissary. The other one is a staff director. Uh, our jail is the first one in the state to have a staff program at 70%. Uh, successful it means seventy percent of people that complete our program does not come back to jail on tax dollars. Uh, and, and and like I say, I'm sure they're tired of me talking. Uh, some things I want to run down real quick is what we do give back out of commissary. I was being questions of what we do with our commissary money. Uh, I roughly give. Um, we pay salaries out of commissary. We pay. Female road crew, the male road crew, all the guys at the animal shelter that are working. Uh, we usually turn over roughly 140,000 a year in salaries out of commissary, $12,000 rent of the facility that we use our commissary. Um, we use inmate uh, commissary to buy the mats. We don't have to buy out of budget. Uh, security cameras, all the equipment the guys use out in the community. And, and I could, I made a list of everything we do in the community, but you all see it. I don't have to go through the whole list. We roughly have inmates out in every facet of the community, cleaning it up, mowing, uh, cemeteries. Uh, we got grants to the state road department where that salary is paid through the grant. Uh, at the end of the day, this is money that's never been turned over to the fiscal court. Roughly a quarter million dollars we give back every year in salaries and money that the county is saving to have people do these jobs. Uh, there's been question, uh, some things I need to clarify. We do not house our Montgomery County inmates in any other facility. Uh, we have inter-county contracts, which is mandated by jail standards. So when you see in the newspaper that we've got contracts with Brown, Bourbon, Powell, Clark, we're not sending our inmates there. We've got to have a uh, emergency situation comes along, a tornado, a fire. We've got to have mass evacuation routes where we have, uh, have contracts with these facilities to hold them in case of a mass evacuation. There was some confusion when we, we passed these mass agreements that I was bringing state inmates in across the state and I was shipping my county inmates to other facilities. That's not true. Uh, if we do house our Montgomery County inmates, we trade with the facility. For, uh, for example, uh, I'm sure you all are aware, uh, one of my deputies was killed last year, uh, almost a year this week. And the, the lady that was charged with his murder has been housed in another facility. And what we do is we house one of the other inmates that has a conflict, so we don't have to pay the cost. So, okay, can I borrow some days? Uh, we, uh, at the end of the day, I'm very proud. I'm very proud uh, of what we've accomplished and what we've done and what we continue to do. Uh, I'll continue to every fiscal court meeting to advocate for my staff for more money. I know it's not a place and time for it, but I'm, I'm going to be blunt about it. My staff deserves more money. Uh, I do not, you know, any way around it. Uh, my jail is open to you. It's your jail. Uh, uh, Shannon Denson, I will say, you know, he came up. We sat down and looked at everything. And anybody in this community is welcome to come to my facility and look at numbers. Thank you. Okay, before I pass it down, I just wanted to, because I was about to hit my 10 minute limit, I just wanted to add a few more things. As mayor, I'll tell you, City of Mount Sterling's in good shape. We've had two previous mayors that did a superb job. We have had city councils going back uh, years and years that have made very forward thinking, proactive decisions while living within the budget that we have. We're in, okay, we're in good shape. We're in good shape now. Yes, we have a reserve. You want a reserve in place if we have something happen in this community like what happened to West Liberty a few years ago. You've got to be able to continue to provide services to your community. That's why you sock money away. 
That's why we have a rainy day fund for the what if, that if something comes up, we've got money set aside. The biggest thing we have that set aside for is the pensions. Now, we're playing the hand we're dealt, and I'm speaking for the city here, okay? We are playing the hand we're dealt. We don't control what goes on in Frankfurt. Frankfurt's got their own challenges trying to fix the pension issues that are down there. But part of that fix has been that there's increased employer contribution rates on local governments that we are seeing at levels that have never been seen before. This year for hazardous and non-hazardous employees, our employer contribution rates are gonna be higher than they ever have been in history. For every, for every dollar I pay a police officer, I'm gonna send the state of Kentucky 39 and a half cents for the pensions. That's not including the medical, the dental, the social security, the workers comp, everything that goes on, all those other employee benefits. That's just for pensions. So for the city of Mount Sterling, we can look now to say, yes, we've got a, and, and I'm sorry, I got kind of ahead of myself. Our portion of the, the unfunded liability that GASB 75, Government Accounting Standards Board, tells us we have to carry on our books is $6 million. It was $4 million a couple years ago, now it's $6 million. So the state of Kentucky is telling us this is your portion of the pension liability. So when I sit here and look as mayor, although, yes, we're okay now, I see a storm on the horizon. And this is an opportunity for the city of Mount Sterling to make sure, although we've prepared ourselves for you know, every possible worst case scenario, that this is an opportunity for us now to get ahead on our pension payments, to put money aside. And that's what the city will be doing, uh, creating a line item basically to be one year ahead on our pension payments. I'm not sending the money to the state, but we will have that money available. I want everybody to think what happened. Was anybody here in 1980, late 80s, when A.O. Smith and Hobart closed? <laughs> it was anybody here? Yeah. A few of you. <laughs> it devastated this community. It devastates this community not only because of the jobs that are lost and what it takes away from a community, but your local governments are now left with a huge shortfall in revenue. So if that worst case scenario happens, and we certainly hope that never happens, but this would all also give us the opportunity, it would give us the availability of time to be able to make those serious decisions that if one of our larger companies leaves that we do have those pension payments socked away and it's given us about a year's, the, the, a year's heads up so we can start making you know, those, those tough decisions we're gonna have to make for our employees. So, and then also I would remind everybody, although the restaurant tax, the 2% that is collected from restaurants in the city of Mount Sterling goes to, pet, goes to our tourism and our parks and rec, which also funds portions of, it's not a huge funding, but the airport gets some of that money, the Historical Society, Gateway Regional Arts, Tourism, and then the rest goes to Parks and Rec. That's what's making the payments on our parks, because we still owe on Easy Walker Park, and the pool, the new pool that we're gonna have in this community. But the city of Mount Sterling holds that liability. So if something were to ever happen to that restaurant tax, because that could be challenged in court and gone in a heartbeat. The city, is, the city is, is sitting here with the responsibility of making those payments. So as I sit here as mayor telling you, although we're fine right now, this really puts us in a good position to be able to prepare for worst case scenarios, to be ahead on our pension obligations to the state. Every employee that's down here that's a police officer, every employee at Public Works, paid in everything they were asked to pay. The city of Mount Sterling has paid in everything we've been asked to pay for years. And now we're being told to pay in more. So it is unfortunate that we have come to this time, but for the city, this comes at the right time for us because we're gonna be able to prepare for those worst case scenarios. I did mention 
39.5%. For, for every dollar I pay a police officer, 39.5 cents is going to the state of Kentucky. This year, for every um, public works employee that I pay a dollar to, it's 24.5 cents. Levels we've never seen. Guess what? It's going up next year. We've been told that those police rates are going to go to 57 cents. So we've got some tough days ahead of us. But I'm sure they wished, however many years ago, they could have addressed it then and not now. We have an opportunity to address this, this storm we see on the horizon and prepare for it so it doesn't hurt so far down the road, so we don't have to start cutting services. I have heard, I have heard, we're, let's cut the fire department. Do you think Nestle wants to be here without a fire department? They do not. I have heard, let's get rid of our pull. I had a pull when I was a kid. Our kids deserve a pull. So we've got, we've got challenges ahead of us. But like I said, I think this is the right decision at the right time because it's in the best interest of not only the city of Mount Sterling, but this county. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm Tony Tipton uh, on Mount Sterling City Council. Been on there a number of years. Um, I'll make it quick, short, and sweet so uh, everybody can get to asking questions and we can get out of here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here tonight. It shows real community spirit and an interest in what we're doing as, as local governments. I um, also want to make a differentiation between city and county. We only account for the city and <clears throat> not the county. The county uh, fiscal court and the county judge takes care of that, and the mayor and city council take care of the city. Um, I want to thank Daryl and Ann for, for putting this together. I appreciate that. And I'd also like to thank uh, uh, everybody that showed up tonight uh, from fiscal court uh, to the city council on down. Uh, we've got uh, myself, Mayor Botts, uh, Debbie Helton, and Pam Murphy from the city council. And uh, we appreciate what you all are doing on our city council. Um, like I said, I'm going to try and make this short and sweet. Uh, like Mayor Botts said, we're in, as the city goes, we're in good financial shape. We always have been. We plan for years and years, and through good financial management and good fiscal responsibility, we're not in bad shape. Extra money that comes from this, um, from this proposed tax increase, it's mainly to help the county. The city will derive some from it, but I can tell you that the excess that we do have from uh, these taxes, we intend on giving that back to the community. Um, at least that's my stance, and I think a lot of the folks on the council are in agreement. Uh, we want to take that excess and reduce the uh, the city property taxes. So if you own property tax, if you own property in the city of Mount Sterling, even if you are a renter, it's going to trickle down to you to you as well. So um, it's basically a wash for us with the city um, to that degree, and we are here to help our friends and neighbors in the county. I own property in the county as well. I don't want I don't want to be out on my property at midnight or anywhere else and need uh, some emergency services, need a sheriff's deputy out there for some reason, and then say, sorry, you're gonna to have to call the state police in Moorhead and they'll send somebody out. I'm not gonna stand for that, and I don't think people in Montgomery County should stand for that. And that's exactly what potentially can happen without this. So uh, uh, that's why I support it, and that's why I'm gonna do it. And uh, I'm gonna vote in favor of it. Thank you. Get this stretch harder. Well, I'm Debbie Helton, I'm the city council, and I'm the new kid on the block. I really haven't had time to temper around like my buddy here <laughs> uh, to these hard things. But uh, I can tell you that I've struggled. I've lost sleep. I've spoken to everyone here at the table. I've spoken to some that's in the audience. Um, while I wasn't sleeping, I decided to pray, and that was the best move I made. But uh, after all was said and done, I thought about my granddaughter, Aubrey. Aubrey's a third grader at Mount Stern Elementary. And uh, we need fire and, and ambulance and, and 
and 911, and hopefully she never needs it. But she's going to love the pool and the parks and, and the beauty of this beautiful city and, and Montgomery County for many, many years to come. And so, even though I was against it in the beginning, I was on the fence and off the fence and around the fence, and, and I didn't really know what to do. But when I started really thinking about my life here in this in, in Montgomery County, and I was traveling in, it really made it easy for me to say, yeah, uh, I need to do my part. This affects me, my family is all here in Montgomery County, and uh, I'm like the mayor. I, I, I'm gonna be a team player. County needs the help. It's not gonna kill me. I'm, I'm very blessed. I know it's gonna hurt others. I don't mean to say it's not gonna be hurtful, so watch it there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying it's not the end of the world for me to pay the extra 1%. So um, I'm thankful to uh, have the opportunity to serve you, and I'm, I'm happy to talk with you anytime. But I can tell you that I'm definitely a supporter of the increase. I'm really going to be short. <laughs> I'm Pam Murphy, and I'm on the city council, and I am in favor of the tax, and it's basically just a numbers game. I think, you know, in 1987, when we had 1%, and we've been living on that 1%, cutting back, making making do, but we've lost the industries, we're losing revenue, and, and we all know it takes more to live now than it did in 1987. So I think in order to not keep band-aiding the problems and to make progress, we need to vote on it. We need to accept the 2%. Good. Darrell, I'd like to make one more comment if I could real quick and we'll save it a minute. Uh, I'd just like to reiterate what uh, Mayor Boss said earlier. Uh, we also fought, fall under the guidelines and I don't think that the judge mentioned that, that uh, uh, it meets a form through KRS. We're not allowed to have so many people here too. Uh, Commissioner Townsend, she was on the radio this morning with Mayor Boss. Uh, she had a prior engagement or she would have been here. She's probably a whole lot better speaker than uh, most of us, uh, but uh, but I did want to let you know that the reason that the other two commissioners are not here is because of the KRS. So, uh, uh, and it also, if you get a chance, I ask that you go to Melanie Townsend's uh, Facebook page. She has some worksheets on there, and uh, that will clearly help understanding with numbers on the situation that we're dealing with. Thank you. on while well, that was on too for we've all had the uh, horrible experience of that feedback and, and uh, this is a borrowed system and uh, myself and two or three kind of plugged it in right here tonight for the first time and wow it's working um, all right we've got uh, we've got three cards here with some questions on it I don't know if anybody else has any more that they filled out that they want to uh, present as well but uh, perhaps this has uh, already be, been answered, but I'm going to read it off the card. Uh, this is addressed to the city. If the city is financially sound, why raise taxes? Okay. So if the city is financially sound, why raise taxes? So, and I think that was, I hope that I was able to explain that, so I won't go back through 10 minutes more and bore you all with that. But, but really, we look at this as a, we are in agreement with the county. We have an interlocal agreement. We do not, it is not in our best interest to break that. So therefore, we support the county and the decision they're gonna make here. And we're also gonna vote for that. That will help us maintain that interlocal agreement to where we share the revenue that comes in at a 60-40 split. The alternative, if we do not vote for it, you're asking for the city to now impose their own tax on top of the 2% that the county would have. Now the county, like I said, may be able to 
you'd have to work out some legal agreement that if you paid the city, you got credit toward the county, and that's certainly something that's doable. But that's what initially you'd be doing is asking for an increase in taxes for those that reside within the city limits. And then the second thing I would add and just reiterate, the city, if we were to go it alone, would have a loss in revenue. The majority of the, the jobs reside out in the county. So if I only had the ability to draw revenue from the city of Mount Sterling, let's go back to the first things I was talking about, then we start looking to annex property because we need a bigger tax base. And that's a horrible road to go down. You see cities in this state that are in trouble because they went out and tried to annex property. Annexing property brings in revenue, absolutely. But guess what? You gotta fix those streets, you got police coverage, and for the city of Mount Sterling, you have to pay the fire bill. Property owners in Mount Sterling get the benefit that the city pay, has a fire contract. We pay that fire contract for those property owners. So the more we annex, the bigger that bill is gonna be to the fire department. So that causes us as a city to make, we need to make good decisions if we're gonna look to annex property because it's gonna end up driving up our costs in the end. So that's not the answer. So I probably went on longer than I should have, but the bottom line is why are we going along with it? Because it's in the best interest of the city that we continue the agreement that we've had with the county and that we share that revenue. I failed to mention one other little minute thing. We were going to try to hold answers to two minutes. Now, how, how fair was that? No, you can't get that microphone. How fair was that of me to say that after the fact? I apologize for that. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, I promise I'm not trying to filibuster. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> not my intent. All right. Okay. Uh, the next question here is for uh, the jailer. It says, the jailer, according to State Auditor Harmon, was cited for doing business with his partner, quote, food service, end quote, budget increased 100,000 to 300,000. Is doing business with his partner the reason? The jailer, according to State Auditor Harmon, was cited for doing business with his partner, and it has food service budget increased 100,000 to 300,000. Is doing business with his partner the reason for that increase? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, like I said before, our food costs have went from over four dollars per tray per inmate to a dollar nineteen. In eight years, our food costs. I'm not. I, I don't have the budget in front of me, but I do say that our, our food budget has only went up eight cents per tray over eight years. Eight cents per tray per uh, in eight years I've been here, and that's from 2011 to current. Uh, I'm not a partner with my food service provider. Uh, I do uh, have an interest in a commissary business uh, that my daughter runs for me in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, as far as the food service, I do not own any of the food service business, period. Um, and it's, like I said, it's open records. Our food costs have went up eight cents from 2011 to 2019, um, which is probably cheaper than any jail in this area. services to cut cost example building inspector yes so good question 
Um, and that's part of a much larger discussion that we could certainly all get in a room and have down the road. You know, I, I say all the time we're, we're, we're conducting government the way we did in the 50s and 60s, right? It may not be the best model. We may be able to look down the road to get to a point where we could merge our government. That's a complicated process, but certainly uh, something that I think is, is worth a serious discussion. Because if the models that are around the state, if we start seeing municipalities, cities, counties starting to fail, then obviously you gotta look to do something different, right? So I think that's a good, good observation and something to look forward down the road. Um, as far as sharing services, uh, absolutely. Um, actually, I tried and we just couldn't work it out with the county, but we, I really wanted to share a building inspector because that made sense to me coming in as mayor that if we could share those costs, it would save us both a bunch of money. Um, I ended up hiring a part-time building inspector instead of a full-time building inspector because I just didn't think we had enough for a full-time building inspector. But um, certainly we did try that and um, I, I think that that's something as a city and a county that we should look to see where we can share. Um, we do it with our police a lot and our police will back up the sheriff's department and they'll come back us up uh, when things get tough. Uh, no matter what the jurisdiction is, we have an agreement for that. Um, so we are trying to be mutually supportive. There's times, you know, we, we have helped the county with some mowing and they've in turn helped with mowing some city areas. So uh, we do do that on a very limited level, but certainly I can assure everybody if, if, if we can find something that makes sense that we could share, then I think it's something that we should seriously discuss. Sorry. I'm not like Al, I'm not going to take all your time, but I'm going to give a quick response. Uh, there is something you failed to mention, and that we do uh, share dispatch. Dispatch, uh, good uh, yeah. It's a 50-50 deal. Uh, it's a win-win uh, for the community. When I was, a, of course, a lot of you might, might not know, I was an officer here for 20-plus years and retired from the city of Mount Sterling. At one point in time, I was over-dispatched. The city had the whole kitten caboodle, so to speak. Uh, and then it came to the point where we merged all these radio systems together and developed a 911 board. It has been the best thing. Uh, that way nobody feels like they're getting more service than the other. And it's a 50-50 match and a win-win for the community. instead of working to allow more development and commerce. And along with that, I've seen a couple of other questions that are very similar uh, to that. Um, says This one says, you all have mentioned the loss of industry. So why have you just sat back and done nothing to get new industry and then now have decided to raise taxes on the few remaining industries and their workers rather than work to get more factories and employees. I'll try to answer that. We have lost the four industries that I've mentioned. Right now, we have several industries in Mount Sterling that's looking to hire people every day. We have a drug problem. That's the re and that's the biggest reason we cannot get another industry in here, because we have so many jobs available at our industrial park right now. Uh, there's so many people that goes out there, they work two days, they, they leave because they failed a drug test, or they can't pass the drug test. So that's not, can't, you can't blame the county government for that. You can't blame 
made for that. 51% of the people that works in our industry drives from 17 different counties, surrounding counties. 51% of our workforce in these industries, industrial jobs here, drives from 17 joining counties. We just don't have the workforce here that is willing to go to work or can go to work due to the fact they've got problems with drugs. I promise this will be less than two minutes. Uh, that sounds like a letter that was sent to the paper yesterday. I can assure you every one of us is working. I think that was petty. Uh, I think it was uncalled for. Uh, I'm up at the crack of dawn and I'm here till the evening hours working for this city. So I want to make that clear. I know these men and women that are up here are committed also. Um, and we're, we're doing one of my favorite quotes, do the best can with what you got, where you're at. That's what we're doing right now. And I know there's a lot of ideas and hey, that's okay. Bring me a good idea. I'm all for it. But I, I need to hear it, okay? I don't need a letter to the paper putting me and Wally down. I need you in my office. I need you having a conversation. Give me an idea. If you think we can be doing something better, come let me know. I have said since day one, since I took office, this is the best job I ever had. I love being mayor of the city of Mount Sterling. My door is open. I'm out. I'm trying to talk to business owners. Tell me what's going on. Tell me how I can improve things in Mount Sterling. I want to hear the good, bad, and the ugly. But you got to give me a chance. You got to let me hear those things. You got to have the conversations with me. So I ask you to do that. And I assure you, we are working and doing everything we can to improve this community. Yeah, we've, we've constantly been after that, uh, bringing in industry and jobs. One of the things that I've just recently uh, read, as a matter of fact, it was just today, and it came out this month, uh, an analysis of the fastest growing populations in the state of Kentucky by county. There's 120 counties in the state of Kentucky. In the top 20% is Montgomery County. We are number 12 on the list, which means we are in the top 10%. And you know why we are growing so fast? Because we have so much industry and so much jobs, and we have so more jobs than people can fill. And that's why we have better than almost 58% of the folks that are going to be paying part of this payroll tax from outside of Montgomery County, because we are a central hub for industry. Our industry is strong. Yeah, we've had some losses, but we've made up with made up for them. We're a whole lot better than we were years ago in the 80s when, uh, when Hobart ran out. So uh, look up your statistics. It, it, it's, uh, we're number 12 on the growth chart uh, Montgomery County is for the state of Kentucky. And that was based on 2018 uh, information. And I'm sure that uh, when we did the census, we're probably going to be well over 30,000. some percent of people live outside of the county. Uh, we felt this was the best way to go. Uh, not so much, and also the easiest, uh, but uh, again, I can't say enough how important it is that uh, this tax is passed. Thank you. Sorry, a couple questions that uh, kind of are very similar here. Uh, one is, um, how is
is this situation that's been described here tonight going to be avoided in the future? Uh, and this other question kind of goes along with that. Do you plan to implement any of these uh, ideas? Uh, and it, this was kind of follows this last question that you just answered uh, to try to prevent future increases. So primarily, what is, uh, what, what are you trying to do or what is the situation? How can this situation best be avoided in the future? Well, I'd like to say that this is definitely not a cure-all. Uh, you know, money only lasts so long. Uh, we were, was fortunate on the, the first percent that was passed that it lasted, I'm sorry about that, uh, lasted 40 years. Uh, we hope that we can make this last 40 years. Uh, hopefully, as Tony said a little while ago, we are supposed to be one of the fastest growing communities in Kentucky. So hopefully, you know, uh, in the near future, uh, we can get rid of our build ready site, have a factory in here and uh, growth that uh, we will be flooded with, with tax revenue. So uh, that's where we're at. Basically, uh, what 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 is going to try to be done to avoid having this crucial situation again in the future? Pretty unusual, and I'm gonna say something. I feel this is one of the reasons that I had such a problem uh, going along with this because I said, okay, what we're gonna do then? I'm gonna. Well, we're going to be right back in the same shape again. So the solution obviously is that we have to keep our department heads accountable. The city will do that. We are doing that. Our, our department heads speak at every one of our meetings and make a report. Um, the county, I don't know what they're doing, but I know they need to keep their department heads accountable. We do. And, and, and I'm sure that but we can't, they, they have to cut wherever they can. They, they need to go to them and say, look, you got to cut your budget somewhere. You got to make the hard decisions. You know, back in 2009, I lost my job with the Walker Company because the Walker Company needed to, they had some budget problems. They had to downsize. They had to make some really tough decisions and I got booted. And we're going to have to make, the county is going to have to make these hard decisions. The city is going to have to make these hard decisions. And I, for one, am going to be expecting that from both the county and the city. Yeah, and I would echo that. I'm, I'm mayor for the next three and a half years. <laughs> city council, I'm, I'm accountable to them. I'm accountable to the taxpayers here. How do we not get here again? We need to make sure that we're open, transparent, trying to explain ourselves the best we can, and we need to make sure that the public's involved, and, and I meant that when I said it earlier. I need input, I need good ideas, all right? I, I, we, none of us can do this alone. So, how do we not get here again? We, we just need to be on top of our game, making good decisions now, and I believe that the decision now that allows us as a city to get ahead on those pen that pension uh, payments there uh, really keeps us out of a bad situation down the road because I assure you, we're gonna manage that money wisely. You mentioned pensions. Here's a question related to that. It says, what are these funds from the increased payroll tax going to be targeted use for besides pension related? Good question, then I'll turn it over. So for the city of Mount Sterling, it is pensions. I'm looking at $800,000 next year for my pension payment. 700,000 this year, next year it'll go up to about $800,000. So we're gonna have a line item to go ahead and put that money, next year's pension payments away this year. Um, I did make a commitment to the voters of Mount Sterling that I would address blight in this community. So we're gonna put a little money aside for that to start tearing down some properties that have been blighted and abandoned for way too long. 30 properties alone in one area of town
that have said here empty, enough's enough. We've got to address those. So I'm going to set some money aside for that. Um, other than that, like uh, Tony said earlier, the city of Mount Sterling is going to look for any surplus that we have to give that back. I don't, and, and our intent is to do that through property taxes. So if there's any surplus that's left, then I've made the commitment as mayor, the city council has made that same commitment that we will return that through property tax every way we can and that uh, we'll give it back to the taxpayers. Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, I know you're, you've heard enough of the pension. That's mandatory, we have to do that. But what the county would like to do, see more of, is infrastructure in the Montgomery County area. Our roads are good. Our roads are as good as anywhere in the state of Kentucky, the county roads. And I'd like to maintain that. I would like to keep them like that. If you don't trust me, if you don't blame me, drive to Nicholas County, drive to Bath County, drive to Clark County, Powell County. Montgomery County roads are, as, are better than any of them. But we have to keep spending money to maintain it, to keep the roads like that. I guess I'd like to just touch base, touch base just a little bit on that. Uh, what we would use the money for, I think, the number one thing would be to build our reserves. Uh, we would like to have a five-month reserve, uh, five million dollars, uh, uh, set back in case of, so we can uh, be able to make our payments. Uh, but we'd also like to build money and hopefully to be able to get a good return back on that money and utilize it to help all, offset some of the costs. What, I'll look, what we're looking at is back in January, we, uh, and I'll give you a little insight on the jail. Your hopes are as you have enough state inmates to help offset the cost of housing your own county inmates. Back in December, we had approximately 42 state inmates uh, with an average daily population running around 220. We're trying to keep our numbers around 220 to 230, which is still almost 100 over capacity with 15 cells that breaks down about six inmates sleeping on the floor, which is, uh, it, it's feasible for me to do. Um, so what we have done as of today, we've, uh, I think the daily population was 218 inmates with 101 uh, state inmates. So that's going to over double our state inmate uh, income per month. Uh, so, and we've continued to work with the district courts, uh, county attorney's office and district judges where we're utilizing on misdemeanors uh, for the first time since I've been jailer. We're utilizing uh, community service workers instead of incarcerating them at a cost to the taxpayers uh, on average of 31 to $35 a day. Their sentences now have been uh, diverted to community service hours, which we're using to pick up garbage, work at the jail, work at the parks and rec, and work in our inmate garden. So it, it's working on both ends of keeping our county inmate level down, keeping our state inmate uh, population up, and cutting our uh, cost of running the jail. Um, this is for uh, the jail. Uh, I'm going to try to combine these two. On average, what percentage of inmates housed in our jail are Montgomery County inmates? And what percentage are shipped here? And are we responsible for the medical expenses of inmates who are shipped in? If so, does that amount exceed what we receive for those inmates? That's a, that's a one of those questions that, um, on average, I believe, I can give you an example of today. Today we have 218 inmates, uh, 101 are state. Um, I'm was, I think we've got eight Menifee County, which that's the only other county we're housing for, and the rest of them are ours. Um, we roughly make $1,000 a month per inmate for state inmates, and we also get a medical allotment check every year to offset the cost of the medical. Uh, we do have a Class D coordinator who, uh, when we talk about bringing state inmates in, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's kind of like trading cattle. We call across the state, once it's overcrowded, we bring them in here. Once we get overcrowded, we call other communities or other jailers and they take care of state inmates. But our class D coordinator does a uh, hell of a job by making sure that when he does call and get a list of inmates, that he also calls the jail's medical department and gets a list of any medications or 
medical treatment they are receiving. Uh, we will not bring them in if they are on medical treatment or taking prescription drug uh, prescriptions. Uh, we just we choose to refuse them. Uh, we continue to just call around and find uh, enough inmates where we can make one trip, maybe three jails, but we pick up inmates that uh, are not going to cost us money. Not being said, the same guy that don't have medication today may have a heart attack tomorrow. We cannot predict that. Uh, but when we are bringing them in, we do screen them for medical cost. Um, here's another question, uh, and I guess this is to both city and county. Uh, why did you vote on this before informing the public and asking for the public's input? When we started discussing this, uh, like I say, we had discussed having to raise revenue is either payroll tax increase, high property tax increase, and insurance premium tax, tax which Montgomery County doesn't have. We, we did not inform the public of this. Uh, we had a meeting when we were discussing it, and Tom's usually at our workshops. When we were discussing it, uh, Al and I had a proclamation to sign in my office. Al was leaving, we hollered to him to come back, and that's what he thought about it. So that's, that's when, that's when the, the decision was made. Uh, we felt like it's something we have to do. We, we don't have a choice. Uh, it's, it's not a want, it's a need, it's a have to. I would just say that our agendas are posted and provided to the press. It, it was on the agenda. So certainly I'm not in a habit of standing up and saying let's hold a forum for everything we're going to talk about. I'm sure you all probably would have appreciated if we could have done that. Um, but we, we posted our agenda like we normally do and it was addressed at the council meeting. the reason for the first and second reading. The first reading brings it out in the second reading. You know, so you've got time in that month to, to investigate or talk or ask questions. I'll probably be in on it also. It might not be my place, but for eight years, we've talked about it. I mean, I don't think it's something that we intentionally hid. Uh, even as jailer, we've talked about it. Uh, our workshops are uh, open to the public. Uh, daytime is not convenient, but look again tonight. We had it at 6.30 at night, people request at night, and to be honest, I thought we'd have a bigger crowd tonight. Uh, it's nothing we just shocked us and surprised us. As far as I'm concerned, I think we've talked about it for many years, and it's finally got to the part where we have to. I'd just like to say that we recognize this problem uh, even more in the last three years after losing the factory. So uh, even though we didn't talk, talk on it you know, regularly, uh, we did discuss it every once in a while and it laid in the back of our minds and hoping that things would get better and we wouldn't even have to do this. But uh, you know, we, it hasn't, uh, we're here and we have to make that decision. Um, got a couple more questions uh, down here. Um, but I'd like to say, um, before we continue, and I was going to say this at the end, I should have said it at the beginning, uh, and I've kind of tried to answer this on uh, the only reliable communicating system that we know, known to man, social media. Uh, just, that's a joke. Everybody laugh. No. It, it's a good tool. Certainly it is. But there's a lot of ideas that obviously are put out there that may or may not be true about things. One of those that I want to address specifically was about this meeting tonight. Nobody on in city or county government had any part of planning this meeting for tonight. Uh, 
uh, Ann and I did meet with Wally and Al uh, and asked them uh, about having that meeting. And then we went about trying to schedule a meeting at the best possible time that we could based on the time that's left between at that point and Tuesday, which is the day of both meetings in which the vote will be made. The, the opportunity that was best uh, with facilities, with all things considered, was tonight. And so that was a decision that Ann and I made together. And so that's not on any of them up here. That's the best we could do. I mean, so. Um, all right. I've got, I think it looks like two more questions here. Um, what happens if we let the state fix this pension problem overall? It's their decisions that created it. What happens if we let the state fix it overall, this pension issue? It's their decisions that created it. Well, absolutely. I would love to see the state address the pension issue again. I, I believe it's come to the point where we need to get everybody in the room, sit down, come up with a brand new plan, okay, to put it very simply. Um, I have expressed our concerns to our elected representatives from this area, and they know how this is affecting us at a local level. We have a governor's race this year. I encourage everybody to ask every candidate for governor, what's your plan to address the pension system? What's your plan to put in a long-term fix? Because in my opinion, Mayor Al Botts, the answer is not pushing it down on your local governments to fix. I said before, we paid in everything we have been asked to pay for years and years, and now we're being told, here's your portion of the unfunded liability. We didn't create that. I'm playing the hand I'm dealt. It does me no good to stand up here and point fingers. I'm just playing the hand I'm dealt. But absolutely, I would love to see, and I think that that's where the fix lies, that if we can get this addressed in Frankfurt, then certainly that does relieve this, this long-term issue that we're gonna continue to face. Because as we, as we're able, as we raise this occupational tax now, that does, that does put us in a better position for the next few years, hopefully a long time down the road, but certainly there is the uncertainty of what's going on in Frankfurt. My comment is let the state fix it, really. We're in this position because the state did fix it. They're to blame all the way, in my book. Uh, they robbed the pension funds for years. They didn't put any money back in. Uh, and now they're, they're looking to us to pay. After we've already paid in 100% all of these years. Honestly, my answer to them, to the state, when they tell us, hey, we need more from the city, my answer's gonna be no. No, we paid in our fair share, we paid in 100%, and if you wanna come get it, come get it. And I'll be standing right at the front door, and if you wanna take me to jail because I didn't pay it, come get me. That's my answer to the state. <laughs> and that's why I felt for a long time. Real, real quick on unfunded liabilities, I'm sorry, Darrell, I'm over my two minutes. The unfunded liability for the city amount selling for pensions is $6 million, that's what they're telling us. Uh, I believe Winchester is closer to 11 or 12. I think Richmond's 20 million. I believe Lexington's 200 million. I believe Louisville is about 800 million dollars. Um, so that's a lot of a lot of unfunded liability that's been pushed out to local governments to make up shortfalls. And and I'll say that that's not fair, but it's the hand we're dealt. We gotta play the hand I'm dealt. All right, got a couple other questions here. Um, what are your thoughts on making our county wet? It would bring more restaurants and businesses at our other exit. I'm assuming that means exit 113. Uh, and would bring in more revenue for local government. Uh, I'll just touch a little bit on that. Uh, back when I was first elected, uh, I live on Winchester Road and 
just right down from uh, a food mart, uh, they had came to me and asked me, said, you can drive a quarter of a mile down the road and go to CVS and then we can't get a, a liquor license or a beer license. Uh, totally understood. Uh, we did talk about it. I don't know if we could, would have the votes to, to get it passed. Uh, I'm open for it. I'd much rather uh, someone, someone that's drinking stop to a store closer to them than come on down another quarter of a mile and maybe hit and kill somebody. Uh, I'm a policeman and that's kind of the way I look at things. Uh, I'm not saying it's, I don't think it's a big money maker, uh, but you know, at this point in time, I think we got everything uh, on the table. Uh, we have to start looking at generating revenue. You know, who knows what tomorrow is. Uh, Mr. Okay, the last question I have here, um, I, I think, I'll check back through real quick. This is to you, Eric. Uh, why have the jail, and this is obviously it's gonna be repeat in some of these questions. Why did the jail expenses increase? What effect does Bath Camp, do Bath County inmates have on the jail's budget? Darrell, could you repeat the first part of the question? I the second part about Bath County. Why did the jail expenses increase? Uh, as far as the second part is, what cost, of, we, we don't house Bath County inmates uh, anymore at all. Uh, as far as the first part, um, we lowered our population, uh, we cut our state inmates, and we, we moved Bath County to uh, Clark County, um, and that cut our revenue stream on that. Uh, as far as uh, lost revenue, it was losing Bath County and cutting our state inmates as far as costs we covered earlier. Medical costs has risen uh, triple what it was. Medical, uh, medical and building maintenance has increased. Um, other than that, uh, the only <coughs> source of revenue you have at a jail, I mean, we're dealing with people that are stealing, robbing, old child support, they don't have money. They're not paying their fees. They're not paying their uh, booking fees. The only source of revenue you have to run a, a county jail is inter-county contracts with other counties or state inmates. And um, it's a double-edged sword. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a gamble, and we do it on a daily basis. And I feel like we do a great job at it. Yeah, I mean, like I said, when we talked about it earlier, our expenses was medical. Uh, the fiscal court did give my staff uh, a raise was it last year. Uh, last year, uh, and again, not. An, I mean, I appreciate it. I really do. Uh, well, we've actually went from you know ten fifty to eleven. Uh, but let's think about that, guys. Eleven dollars an hour. Uh, the same job that you can get at Wendy's. Uh, you're dealing with murders, child molesters, and rapists. Uh, I've got two applications right now, and probably six spots that I could fill. Uh, you're not going to say, you know, before I could say hey, we're going to pay you a low wage, but you got state retirement that offsets it. Now we don't have that option of saying. You know, now the only option I got is during the interview is we're going to pay you low pay, we're not going to give you very good benefits, and your insurance sucks. <laughs> so that's pretty much what I offer. Um, but at the end of the day, retaining staff, I've got one of the best staffs in the state. Uh, it's, it's statewide known. These guys, these men and women, give this community more than you'll ever know. Uh, you know, we've had uh, situations where we got a cert team. People question, why do you need it? Come up at two in the morning when you got 25 inmates in the cell that have covered the cameras, covered the doors, covered their self and, and, and feces and throwing urine at you. Um, and I've seen deputies in there making $11 an hour to go in and tackle a mental health patient uh, who don't care to throw feces on you and it's probably got HIV, hepatitis or AIDS. And I'm asking people for $11 an hour to do this. Um, Again, I'm going to ask every fiscal court for a raise for my staff. Uh, and I know people's like, you know, we're here talking about raising taxes and you're asking for raises. I'm going to ask every time. Um, and and I, I, I can't help who it upsets because I see what these men and women do. And you're welcome to come out. Judge come out last Friday 
for what two hours and it was we had on an average friday we had 60 go to court that day that means 60 people have to leave my facility get restrained go to the montgomery county courthouse hope nobody drops some dope uh, where they can get a hold of it and drugs coming in up the rectum and body cavities and that's what we deal with you know how do you get drugs in the jail how why are you letting drugs in the jail and it's because these people get creative and my guys are doing the best of jobs and we're paying them 11 dollars an hour uh, and i cannot i can sit here and talk all night about my staff you're great i love you i appreciate you i'm gonna keep fighting for your raises I don't make, try to make it a habit of lying, but I just did. I have two questions left, not one, sorry. Um, why do we give $25,000 a year to the airport? Why not cut that? The, the airport is, is very vital to Montgomery County. Uh, it's vital to the industry in, in Mount Sterling, Montgomery County. Uh, there's planes land out here every day every day of people that's flying in going to the industrial park going to the factories going to the industries that they've they've got here uh it's a, it's vital montgomery county airport it, it, it's vital it's the fifth or sixth largest in the state of kentucky as far as traffic it's 80 plus 80 plus parts a day and it's a lot of traffic out there i would say that's a good question i would just say i think we i wish i had more to invest in the airport I think it's the future of this community. You've got an aluminum industry that's going up in Greenham County, I believe. What better place to have air, uh, someone come in here like Boeing and use our airfield to be able to uh, make a product, make an aircraft, whatever it is. Our, our airport right now can't support that, it's too small. But certainly, I wish we had more to invest in that, to extend that runway because I think it would, be, it would open up our community uh, for the aircraft industry. I, I cut the airport $10,000, it was $35,000, we're down to twenty five dollars now, but I have made a, a major cut there, and that was major to them. Okay, final question. What additional services can we expect to see should the tax increase pass? Example, better roads, improve infrastructure, expand jail, et cetera. I think that question was answered earlier. Is it better infrastructure, better roads? Uh, the industrial park, uh, they can't get into one out there if we don't have the, the water and the sewer for them. It's just that simple. The utility is open. Yes, that's, that's the important part. Better roads, better roads. And, and like I say, we have over 200 miles or roughly 200 miles of county roads that's not the rural roads out in the community even. That's the subdivision roads. This includes all the subdivision roads in the county, pretty much. Most of them that has met the requirements and got the paved roads that we accept in, then that, we take care of those subdivision roads also. Darrell, if I may, I promise, two minutes. I think it's important that we continue to invest in our infrastructure. I've got 90 miles of paved streets in the city of Mount Sterling. We get one per year resurfaced. One mile. You can do the math. We should be doing better than that. We just don't have the money to do more than that. But certainly that's my goal. We continue to invest in that. We got to invest in our streets and sidewalks. Uh, we applied for a grant uh, to put sidewalks out in front of the area on North Maysville Road. We just recently did that. Um, there's, I think everybody has seen that area where there's no sidewalks sometimes. Uh, individuals have to get out in the road and walk. We got to be a better community than that. We got to link that corridor there and allow those people that don't have access to transportation, which there's about 800 uh, households in this community alone that, that have no access to transportation. At least they'd have a sidewalk to work, uh, walk on. So I'll make that commitment that we will continue as a city of Mount Sterling to invest in our streets and sidewalks and every chance we get. And you know, with this revenue, and I should have mentioned it before, um, it does allow us to apply for some of those grants that are out there. There's no free money from the state, believe me. I've tried to get it, it's not out there. State doesn't say, here's a check, go spend it how you want. They want a commitment from the local community. So to get those sidewalks out there, we've got to have a 20% match on most of these in order to get the 80% that comes in. 
in my opinion, that's a good investment. I don't have to build those sidewalks myself. I can have the state come in and help do that, and we provide our local match. So, um, you know, having the additional occupational tax does give us a little more flexibility to apply for some grants that may have been out of our scope or reach before because we just didn't have, you know, we weren't financially capable. Okay. I think that's all the questions that we had uh, submitted tonight. Uh, again, as we are about to close, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight, for the questions that you submitted. Uh, thank you all for being up here to take those questions and answer those. Um, Ann and I um, are trying to look at ways that we can work together in other ways to involve the community more, to be more involved with political aspects of life that help make our county better. Uh, and trying to do that in ways that are not just partisan politics. I don't like you, so I'm not gonna try to work with you type thing. And I think that behooves us all to try to do that. Uh, so in, in that vein, I would just make the recommendation along with like one of the questions tonight. If there is an issue that perhaps might be on the horizon in the future of one that, of perhaps of, of a great deal of public interest as most in government are, uh, I feel confident that we would be more than happy to work together to co-sponsor another event like this uh, for the purpose of information, education, that kind of thing. So. Uh, for what it's worth on that. So, uh, Ann, you get the final word tonight. That lady always get the final word. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to all of you that came tonight. And we've got a super government board. Anytime you need a question answered, these guys, their doors are open to you. And I was just going to reiterate our workforce is not good here in the city, per se. I have a friend that is an HR manager out the road. She has to send 15 people to get one person that can pass a drug test. The majority of them are working at fast food because they don't require a drug tests. So you can see why Eric's having a good time too. So, but with that being said, thank you all. And like I say, if you have any questions, go see Wally. Uh,
mandates what we have to, and, and they know it. Yeah, they can't get another trick on the street. As soon as they come through the front door, and I'd say another thing in front of the hill, they've self medicated for so long. They don't know they're sick. You can get a drug addict smell heroin and medicine for months, been up three or four or five days in a row. And when he comes in and starts detoxing, it's liver, it's probably his kidney, it's not properly. And he's found out he's got hepatitis A. So we've got a grant to help the farm and the fact that we've all lost half of these days. Thank you. 